Hey film fans, what the heck's a movie brat? Let's find out on this episode of the rise and fall of New Hollywood. Hey everybody, in part two of this series, I talked a lot about the industry roots that led to the sort of industrial or production situation that would allow New Hollywood to flourish. I want to talk about the contemporary industry situation, and I'll do that in another video. But first I thought I'd hop over to the creative side and talk about some of the filmmakers who made New Hollywood happen. Oftentimes these people are referred to as the movie brats. And that's usually in reference to people like Martin Scorsese, Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, Francis Ford Coppola. And there's an implication there that this younger generation of filmmakers came out of film schools and changed the industry. And while there's a grain of truth, or perhaps more than a grain of truth to that, that's not the whole story. So what I want to talk about a little bit in this video is how there were really kind of two overlapping generations of filmmakers who brought about New Hollywood, but also how it wasn't all directors and, surprise, surprise, it wasn't all men. The first thing to note is that when we talk about the New Hollywood generation, there's really two generations. Now, they do overlap somewhat, but that difference I think is important to understand the difference in the kind of films that they were making. So we can talk about the older generation and the younger generation. And one of the key differences is how they came up. So let's talk a little bit about that first. We've got a bunch of filmmakers who were born mostly in the 1920s. So if you think of someone born in 25, 28, even up to 1930, by 1970, these guys are 40 or in their 40s. And this generation mostly, not totally, came up through the system somehow. They're one of the last groups of filmmakers to benefit from the apprentice system. Now, not all of them did, but a lot of them did. They tended to come up in one of a few ways. So some of them actually came through theater and you get filmmakers like Arthur Penn and to a lesser extent, maybe Mike Nichols, who got their start directing plays off Broadway and then gradually on Broadway. And then they traditioned into filmmaking. Then you have filmmakers who came up through television. Someone like Sam Peckinpah, who cut his teeth directing Westerns on television. Then you have people like Robert Altman, who got their start making films, but not in Hollywood, outside the Hollywood system. In Altman's case, making industrial films. In the case of someone like John Cassavetes, making independent films, moving into Hollywood, finding it dissatisfying, and moving back to independent films. And in a later video in this series, I'll talk about the independence and what independent films means in the context of New Hollywood. And then you get filmmakers who actually came up through the apprenticeship system, sometimes as directors, sometimes as crew members. Somebody like Hal Ashby, who got his start as a film editor, working on films of people like William Wyler. And so if you're working for William Wyler or George Stevens, you're seeing old Hollywood up front and in person. You're editing films, or in the case of Ashby's early career, assistant editing, someone like Robert Swink, who came up through the old classical system and again are familiar with the hierarchical structures, but also importantly, familiar with classical Hollywood filmmaking style. What editing is supposed to be what framing is supposed to be, how cameras work, how sets work. So what you end up with this generation, these guys born in the 20s, is a cohort of filmmakers by 1970 who have one foot in the old system as it was declining but still quite powerful, and one foot in this new system, this, this sort of countercultural changing system. And not all the old school guys survived that, but people like Ashby and Altman and Alan Pakula and Sidney Lumet, they were fascinated by what the younger generation was doing, but they also had their own ideas about how to make films with this new freedom that came about as 
the studio system collapsed. The second group, or second generation, are filmmakers who were born in the late 30s into the 40s. And this might seem quibbling, but if you take a look at someone like Martin Scorsese, born in 1942, Sidney Lumet, born in 1924, you've got these two poets, these two cinematic poets of New York City, and there's an almost 20 year age gap between them. So by 1970, Scorsese's 28, Lumet's 46. That's a pretty big difference, not just in terms of age, but also in terms of experience, especially when we talk about coming up through classical Hollywood or coming up as classical Hollywood is waning. And it's this younger generation that's often referred to as the movie brats. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But the main one is that these guys were incredibly film literate. Now, the reputation is that they all went to film school. They didn't. Some of them went to film school and graduated or even went to graduate school and got master's degrees in film, like Scorsese or Coppola. Some of them spent a little bit of time in film school, but didn't finish, like Spielberg. And some of them didn't go to film school at all, but were self-educated cineists. Somebody like Peter Bogdanovich, who famously went to the movies almost every day as a teenager and kept three by five cards with all the information about the film, including not only who made it, but, you know, camera angles that he liked, edits that he liked, performances that he liked. And he kept those through the 50s, 60s, and into the early 70s for almost every film he saw. So this is a generation that was incredibly film literate and their film literacy mostly in their youth was based on classical Hollywood. So they all talk about how much they love John Ford, John Huston, Howard Hawks, William Wyler. Ashby's off working with William Wyler. Scorsese and Bogdanovich are growing up watching William Wyler's films. Having said all that, the film schooling was important for a few different reasons. First of all, while they were in film school, they got an opportunity to watch films repeatedly, not just during their run. You have to remember that these generations, or any generation really before the 1980s, was growing up at a time when you saw the film when it played in the cinema. And that was it. You know, there was no VCR, DVD, and certainly no streaming. If you wanted to see The Searchers, you went to the cinema and watched it. Now, they might go watch The Searchers every day for a week, but when it was gone, it was gone. Big films might come back, Gone with the Wind might come through town again, and so on, but you had to see that film in the cinema. By the late 60s and into the 70s, you might catch it on TV once in a while, and then into the 70s when the Z Channel and later HBO came along, you could watch them regularly on television and then video came along and so on. But when these guys were growing up, if you missed it at the movies, you missed it. So for students in film school where they often had film libraries and they could show these films over and over again, this was a massively different way to learn about filmmaking because you could watch scenes more than once. You could study specific cuts. You could study specific framing, specific movements, and so on. So those guys who went to film school benefited from this. The other thing they benefited from was film scholarship and criticism. Now, everybody could go out and buy The Village Voice and read Andrew Saris or The New Yorker and read Pauline Kael. But a lot of what they were reading in film school was early film criticism of somebody like Béla Balaj, but importantly, French film criticism and specifically the French critics writing for Cahiers de Cinéma and articulating the idea of the auteur. Now I'm gonna do a whole video in this series on auteurism and the auteur theory. But to suffice for now, auteurism did two things that was important to these guys while they were in school studying. First, it recast film more forcefully than almost any other argument. It recast film as an art not just as a entertainment or mass entertainment, but as an art form. And if there's an art form, there's got to be an artist. So the argument goes. And in this case, the auteurists cast the artist as the director. And this was incredibly compelling 
not only to the film school students, but to the sort of wider movie going population, including those filmmakers like Bogdanovich, like Spielberg, who didn't go to or didn't stay for long in film school. In addition to reading foreign criticism, they also had greater opportunities to watch foreign films. Allez, quoi, je reste avec toi. De toute façon, j'ai mal à la tête. On sera pas ensemble, mais je voudrais rester à côté de toi. Non, ce n'est pas ça, Michel. Pourquoi vous êtes triste Parce que je suis triste. C'est idiot. Pourquoi tu es triste C'est mieux quand je dis vous ou tu. Pareil. Je peux pas me passer de toi. Tu peux très bien. Oui, mais je veux pas. Regarde une Talbot. Elle est belle, 2 litres 5. Tu es un garçon. Quoi If they were in New York City studying at NYU, or if they were in Los Angeles studying at UCLA, there's a good chance that they could go and see those foreign films anyway. But in film school, they got an opportunity to watch and rewatch these films. So imagine you're reading an article by Truffaut articulating auteurism, and then you go watch Shoot the Piano Player, and you see Truffaut's artistry and you're blown away by his filmmaking, and you assign his ideas about auteurism to him as a filmmaker, as you are learning how to become a filmmaker. So this was incredibly influential. To be sure, film criticism existed before the CAE writers. It goes all the way back to the teens. And film schools were around, film, the study of film was around, but it really took off in the 60s and you had hotbeds of film scholarship in New York, NYU, Columbia, in Los Angeles, UCLA, and USC, in Texas at the University of Texas, and in a lot of smaller schools where their theater programs were starting to bring in film studies as well. And eventually English programs would also bring in film studies. So as the, the legitimacy of film as an artistic medium spread throughout the 60s and into the 70s, so did film studies programs and film schools start to spread throughout the 60s and 70s as well. So what you get with these two interlocking or overlapping generations of filmmakers is a group of people who are immersed in classical Hollywood, either because they came up through the ranks of it or because they grew up watching it, but who've also now been exposed to tons of foreign cinema the French New Wave, the films of Kurosawa, Italian neorealism, and so on. And as they're watching these films, a film like Rashomon or Breathless or Rome Open City, their minds are being blown and they're saying, there's a different way to make films. We don't have to make films strictly like our heroes in Hollywood, strictly like Ford and Hawks and so on. We love them and we're gonna use them <laughs> But we're also going to use these tools, these sort of guerrilla tools of the French New Wave, these guerrilla tools of Italian neorealism, and we can apply those to the films as well. So you get a, a, a generation or these overlapping generations of filmmakers, they're extremely adept at kind of synchronizing and syncretizing these different strains of film. So you can end up with a movie like Bonnie and Clyde, which in a lot of ways is very classical Hollywood in terms of its use of shot, reverse shot, establishing shots, and so on. But in other ways, is very much influenced by the French New Wave. Easy Rider is another example. The 70s films of Martin Scorsese is another example. And you could go through their filmographies and find these examples of Hollywood meets non-Hollywood. And out of that came the filmmaking strategies of the new Hollywood era. You need one? No. If you ever need one, I know a fella can get you a real nice deal. Lots of shit around. Mm -hmm. I never use mine. I'm conservative, you know? But it's a good thing to have just as a threat. <laughs> 
gonna go do my dirt. In another video, I'll talk about the the cultural situation at the time that contributed so much to the tone and the thematic differences between the new Hollywood films and what came before. But for now, what I'm really talking about is the, the sort of filmmaking, the production strategies of these filmmakers who could draw easily from classical Hollywood, French New Wave, Japanese cinema, Indian cinema, the kitchen sink films of, of Britain, Italian neorealism, Hungarian cinema, Miklos Jancho, and so on. Another important thing to keep in mind when we talk about the movie Bratz is not only that it's actually two different generations and that they all came up kind of differently, but that it's not all directors. New Hollywood was incredibly influenced or incredibly affected by other practitioners. For example, the cinematographers of the 1970s are foundational and fundamental to the way those films looked. When you have people like Laszlo Kovacs or Owen Roisman capturing lens flares, Vilmo Zsigman flashing the film, Gordon Willis shooting in the dark, John Alonzo capturing that magic hour. These cinematographers have as much to do with how those films looked as any of the directors did. And the list goes on and on. The writers, Walter Hill, Robert Town, Carol Eastman, Joan Tewksbury, J. Preston Allen. These writers are the ones who brought the themes, brought the, the countercultural ideas, brought their politics into the writing. The editors, Dee Dee Allen, Robert Jones, Verna Fields, Marsha Lucas, these editors also are responsible for the way these films look. Sound designers like Walter Murch and Alan Splett who came along and changed the way Hollywood movies could sound. Now there was a lot of technological advances that also made these developments in cinematography and sound design and editing possible. I'll talk about technology in another video as well. But it was these crew members or these practitioners as they're often called who were just as important as filmmakers, I would argue, as the directors who get a lot of the credit. It's a highly collaborative era. So Gordon Willis could work on a film like The Landlord, Hal Ashby's first film as a director, and the, together the two of them could devise this plan where the films on Long Island are overlit and they're bright and breezy and everything is very clearly defined. And then the films in Brooklyn are dark with very low light and the, the producers complained, I can't see the people's eyes. This is a comedy. We have to see their eyes. And Ashby and Willis pushed for it. And it's part of what makes the film so great. And then someone like Francis Ford Coppola could see that and say, I want that kind of darkness in my film about the mafia that I'm going to make. And so Gordon Willis would come along, shoot The Godfather. And you've got all those low light scenes where, again, the production company, in this case Paramount, is like, we can't see their eyes. So here you have Gordon Willis weaving through these filmmakers, all those, you know, shooting Clute and all those films with Alan Pakula, shooting Woody Allen's films where Woody Allen says that working with Gordon Willis on Annie Hall and Manhattan actually taught him what filmmaking was, not just telling jokes in front of the camera. And you can find the same thing with the writing of Robert Town, the editing of Marsha Lucas on Taxi Driver and Star Wars, you know, two of the most sort of polar opposites in a way, but most important films of the era. So when we talk about movie brats, oftentimes we are talking about the directors, but I would argue that we should really be talking about this whole generation of talent, including the women. And I'm going to do a video on the women of the new Hollywood, but it's important to remember that women were a key component. So you have production designers like Polly Platt. You have writers like I've mentioned, Carol Eastman or Joan Tewksbury. You have costume designers like Anthea Silver. You have 
these wonderful editors, Dee Dee Allen, Thelma Schumacher, Marsha Lucas, Verna Fields. This is another thing that often gets overlooked. We say movie brats and we think Scorsese, Spielberg. But there are actually a lot of women involved with the making of these films and a lot of women creatively responsible for what makes those films good. From the opening scene of Bonnie and Clyde, Dee Dee Allen's artistry is all over that film. So why do we say it's an Arthur Penn film when it's just as much a Dee Dee Allen film? Let me know what you think about that in the comments. When we say movie brats, probably a very narrow definition comes to mind and maybe we can stick with that definition. Maybe the movie brats are just those few film school educated directors who came out of NYU and UCLA in the late 60s and changed the system. But they're not the only ones who changed the system. In fact, if we stick with that definition, we've got a, a very few people. But if we broaden it out and see that the movie brats is kind of a metaphor for overlapping, interlinked generations of filmmakers who aren't all directors and who aren't all men, what we come up with is this massive stable of creative talent all jumping through hoops to work with each other to feed off each other's creative energy men women directors producers writers cinematographers production designers editors sound designers special effects supervisors all working together during this time of industrial freedom to create a body of films that's different from anything in American cinema that came before it or has come since. So if there's one thing that you take away from this, what I hope it is, is that it wasn't just Spielberg and Scorsese. It wasn't just Friedkin and Bogdanovich. It wasn't just Coppola and De Palma. And I love those filmmakers and I love their films. But those films would not exist without Platt and Willis and Tewksbury and Town and Allen and Marsha Lucas and all the other talent that went in to creating the films that we so easily and so readily assign to the movie brats. That's all for now. Let me know what you think in the comments. Did I get it wrong? Do you think of the movie brats differently than what I'm describing? Or do you disagree with my ideas about who's responsible for the making of these films? I'd love to hear what you think. Also, if you've been watching these videos and getting anything out of them, if you've been enjoying what I have to say about the rise and fall of New Hollywood, I would love it if you'd hit the subscribe button. Until next time, I'm Aaron Hunter, and please keep watching movies.